Islamic thinking about uh, the system of governance, they have characterized the state in Islam to be founded on shura, maslaha, and ishtiha, consultation, public benefit, public interest, and to, to ishtihad, to formulate rulings, to issues as they arise. These are the three principles that uh, feature in the writings of Muslim scholars characterizing the system of government in Islam. There is a legal maxim also, Amrul Imam Manut Bil Maslah, that uh, affairs of the leader is judged by reference to the maslaha in the benefit of people. You see there is a lie. You say that uh, much of this Islamic government is, is a secular government in, if you see this aspect of it. You also visualize secular, maybe uh, there is an aspect to it and I will explain that. That government essentially in Islam is committed to the management of the secular affairs of the people. It has very little role in aqaid, in ibadat, in worship matters, in the matters of belief, in the matters of halal and haram, in the values that you find. Uh, this is commitment in, uh, in, in a substantive sense. Uh, there is an aspect, uh, I will come to that, what we make of secularism from the Islamic perspective. But we need not to really worry about itself. M much has been made about this theoretical kind of tension that exists between democracy and an Islamic state. Uh, um, sovereignty, for example, it has been said that it is uh, belongs to Allah and in a democratic system of government it belongs to the people. But this has been a matter of discussion between scholars and 20th century. There are two kinds of sovereignty. One is Siyadat al-Hukum and the other is as sultan al-Tanfiz. The first is sovereignty that tahakkum on values that ruling, rule-making, formulation of laws on values, aqida, ibada, halal and haram, the state does not have a role, much of a role in it. A management role, perhaps, administration. But the role that it has uh, <coughs> is in the capacity of a sultan al-Tanfizi, uh, executive sovereignty, if you might, uh, uh, characterize it. Sovereignty is in any case not an Islamic idea. It is a European idea. Muslim scholars try to make sense of it. But you will find that uh, in the history of Islam, the models of governance that we have, we have all sorts of names. Khilafa, Imama, Sultana, Imara. We don't have this expression uh, uh, Islamic State, al uh, al Islamiyah, which is a 20th century expression emerged in the writings of uh, Rashid Reda and others. This is representative of the sensitivity, it's not accidental, of Muslim scholars not to bring religion into the heart of politics. That is why they avoided this e expression. But then we came to the 20th century in political Islam. Uh, Islam is deen wa dawla. Uh, there was no dispute over that in the past. We recognized the place of government and the place of religion. But then uh, things changed. Uh, traditional Islam basically has very little or no problem with dem democracy. But political Islam is problematic. When it says that the state and religion are the same, then immediately you have politicized Islam and brought it into the center stage of governance. 
Um, <clears throat> um, one, uh, one other point that we may make, the value that democracy brings to us. Uh, in the Islamic thought, there is one gap, there is one major gap. And that is that Muslim thinkers have not really come to conclusion over the method of succession. How the ruler of one government succeeds another. There are some methods discussed, but there is very little consensus. There are some explanations for this. Why? Because of the prevalence of dictatorship uh, over the longer period of Islamic history. The situation I was earlier explaining changed. They have changed and then we had dictatorship did not permit freedom of political thought and therefore method of succession is a lacuna. Democracy does fill that gap. It does provide a method of succession that is based on the people's authority in expression of their political will. In that case, it brings...